Hi. Uh, thanks for attending our session. And I want to start by thanking the American Geographical Society, uh, who awarded me a McCall Fellowship to pursue this project and granted access to their expansive collection that is housed at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Um, I will show many of their maps throughout this presentation. And this talk reports uh, on my continuing research examining historical and contemporary uses of quantitative color schemes. And in an earlier four-way, I presented in Minneapolis in 2015, I think, um, I looked at trends and patterns of color use as I explored the question, um, well, which schemes are currently in use? And now I'm attempting to answer the important follow-up, why? Why do map makers use the colors that they do? So for context, uh, I use the term quantitative color, or QC, to refer to color use to represent quantitative data values on a map or in a data visualization. Uh, displayed here are the seven major categories of uh, quantitative color in frequent use over my chosen historical time frame. Um, patterns of use can reveal useful information about which colors are used and when um, and by who, but to understand the why and the uh, understand under which circumstances, I am examining the events and people responsible for expanding our color vocabulary um, and our abilities to map with color. And I'm charting this through four overlapping timelines or color narratives. Um, and I'm using the hundreds of sampled schemes from the AGS library as the framing device to tell these narratives. Uh, these are my four historical narratives. There's color theory and research, color printing, uh, map production, and map conventions. Now, a couple of disclaimers. First, there I am not charting a definitive history of colors or schemes. Uh, my interests lie in modern cartography. And second, this timeline is for illustrative purposes only and for this talk. So there are a lot of gaps, but I'm also, I have included a lot more information than I have time to discuss today. So the first narrative are advances in color theory and color research. And that begins in the early 1700s and follows the often, uh, often rapid evolution of color theories, color spaces, and applications of color in maps and data visualizations. For instance, in 1766, uh, Moses Harris developed a subtractive color model that is recognizable to anyone today who works in CMYK space. And uh, Herman Van Helmholtz, uh, published an additive color model in 1860, which is the precursor to our modern CIE and RGB color spaces. And of course, I suspect we're all familiar with the work of uh, Charles Munsell, who in 1912 published his color system, which ordered colors in perceptually uniform or equidistant steps according to hue, value, and um, chroma, which are analogous to our modern color visual variables. Most gains in color research within cartography and data visualization occurred only after color measurement and printing technologies had advanced enough to reliably uh, reproduce any color. As Dr. Judy Olson wrote in the History of Cartography, um, with access to color printing, color schemes on maps could be subjected to experimental study. It was becoming worthwhile to develop tools and understanding of color systems for use in cartography. By the 1980s, technological advances allowed researchers to present maps with specifiable colors to human subjects. And as a result, we had this flurry of research that really started in the 1980s, and now today we have a solid foundation for quantitative scheme selection, accommodating color blindness, knowing uh, which m methods are appropriate for classifying data, as we heard in uh, yesterday in Melanie Smith's excellent talk. Um, and designing new quantitative schemes. And the color research community remains very active. For instance, two examples. One can look to the work of Chroma JS or uh, Fabio Cromeri's work in their efforts to hashtag and the rainbow um, by developing perceptually uniform, intuitive color ramps. Now, the second narrative 
is uh, concerns advances in color production and color reproduction. Obviously, color printing technology and affordability affected how color could be used in maps. And through much of the 19th century, map makers hand colored their maps. And it wasn't until offset printing took off in the early 1900s that lithography became more efficient and reliable. Printed images were sharper, they were easier to proof and correct, it was easier to register and align different colors of ink, and importantly, it was easier to maintain color consistency among prints. To illustrate this, here are two maps. On the left is a hand-colored geological map from 1851, and on the right is an overprinted map uh, from 1881. And a closer look reveals their obvious differences as far as color printing is concerned. Um, lithography afforded map makers greater accuracy when adding color to a map, keeping it within specified boundary lines, and as well as greater consistency, again, when producing multiple copies of the same map. Two other significant advances that relate to offset printing which were the four color process, which was introduced in 1906, and the Pantone matching system in 1963. Both of these helped improve workflow efficiency and color consistency even further upon, among their respective release dates. Process color involves uh, four separate color plates for C, M, Y, K, key line or black, and they are combined to produce one color composite image as illustrated in the photos below. Uh, the Pantone matching system is a popular proprietary color management system, and it's used to manage both spot and process colors. So in this illustration, um, the process color is comprised of percentages of CMYK ink. And so this table shows various combinations of cyan and magenta and how the different percentages will produce different hues. And 100% of each will produce a violet color. And I actually often think of colors in terms of percentage mixes when I am designing my own maps. It wasn't until the 1980s that color printing and display hardware became affordable enough for widespread academic and personal use. And these technological advances helped push color theory and research even further. And they coincided with, I would say, a seismic shift in how maps are produced and consumed, which I call here at the very end of this timeline, the digital transition. Now, the digital transition started. It has been occurring since the 1970s. Uh, but it was in the last decade or so that we witnessed how um, we, uh, that we've witnessed a shift in how we produce and consume color. Overall, we're less concerned, I would say, with accurately producing or reproducing colors in print. We can already do that reliably. And now, uh, also less concerned because many of us are medium, both cartographers and data visualists, is the device. And so um, the digital transition is not a standalone uh, topic or event in this narrative. It overlaps with the next narrative, which is map production and reproduction. And I divided this into three, I've divided this into three rough eras um, of map production and map consumption. The first is an era of mechanical map production and print map consumption, which in the 1970s was supplanted by digital map production and a continuation of print map uh, consumption, which is now in the process of being partially superseded by both digital map production, whether th through a GUI or um, uh, command line cartography, and digital or paperless map consumption. And in my opinion, this production and consumption transition is one of the most meaningful contemporary set of events influing, influencing how we map with color. Um, in, the in the 1880s and continuing through the 1970s, cartographers adopted and refined a photomechanical map production process. And with it came a rapid expansion of color mapping um, capabilities. The photomechanical process uh, uses photography to capture and manipulate separate images, which are roughly analogous to today's map layers. And then they were combined to produce a final map uh, image that could be reproduced. And advances in color photography, graphic design, commercial printing, all of these enhance the quality and detail of maps produced via the photomechanical process. But 
Just as technological advances improved and ultimately changed how colors produced and reproduced, so did they change how we um, make our maps, the map making process. And with the invention of GIS, graphic design and data modeling software, uh, this has enabled a fast turnaround in color production, uh, color map production, applying map, uh, colors to base imagery and data, or comparing the aesthetic or representative quality of different color schemes. And that has now, it gradually became as easy as, you know, a single keystroke. Um, and they also brought with them preloaded and default color schemes, which, as we all know, has been nothing but fantastic for the cartography and data visualization community. Um, but that's a wonderful thing, I think, of current software development. There are the current state of both mapping and data visualization software. Uh, there's a lot of awareness in the community about, say, the issues with defaults. And so there are a lot of knowledgeable people on this issue that are involved in the development of empirically tested and standardized color schemes, like say those from Color Brewer. And now they are available in most uh, software libraries, ranging from you know, QGIS, D3, R, Matplotlib, uh, Arc, Mapbox. The communities really are doing an excellent job at attempting to steer people away from making poor color choices. And defaults, uh, of course, play a starring role in my fourth and final narrative, which is the establishment of color conventions, standards, rules, guides, and color defaults. And as you can see, this narrative is under construction, and it is why I applied for the AGS Fellowship in the first place. Um, in order to examine and illustrate these narratives, I needed maps, historical a collection of maps and their color schemes to use. And um, I need an access to a large and well-preserved map collection. And there are a lot of excellent free uh, and digital archives available, but to get the actual maps and then sample the printed colors, um, I wanted tangible artifacts, not something that had been scanned and uploaded. So this slide shows the majority of the photos I took in support, uh, to support my sampling and analysis of these color schemes. I spent four weeks sampling uh, the color schemes of over 650 uh, maps, and I, was using, I used a handheld um, spectrometer to read the colors into CMY, RGB, and lab color spaces. And I did this so I could recreate them to illustrate how color use progressed and changed over time. And note that all maps were sampled as is. Uh, the AGSL serves, um, it stores and maintains our maps in the best possible conditions, climate controlled away from light, but they're old. And given their age, color fade is assumed. So I didn't sample the actual colors as printed necessarily. And a lot of my data are stodgy and descriptive, so I will refrain from showing you too much. But this is kind of an idea of the sort of things, uh, you know, the uh, quantity of information I've gathered. These are just a distribution of five of my major uh, scheme categories, plus one catch-all at the very bottom. And uh, their years of publication. And this is helpful because over time I can see where there are gaps among my sampled schemes and where I need to collect more in order to have a fair representation over that entire time frame. And unlike my previous color research, I am not focused on evaluating the relative quality or effectiveness of any of these schemes. And my intention is not to chastise, you know, long dead map makers for their color decisions. Um, but instead, I'm just attempting to document when patterns of color use emerged, when they died out, when they became conventional or standardized. Uh, in our workflows and our software, and even when they became ingrained in our minds as the correct way to represent a given uh, phenomenon. So I'll illustrate a few of the transitory patterns and issues that I'm interested in. For instance, a big one is just scheme transitions over time. So why do map colors change in, su in successive editions from the same publisher? Which of those changes are arbitrary or guided or mandated? Um, this is, uh, these physical maps of Malawi show 
uh, that over 15 years, color representation of elevation went from on the left, conventional low uh, contrast hypsometric scheme to on the right, 1985, an unconventional high contrast, in my opinion, very beautiful scheme. But why did these changes occur? Uh, were style guides updated? Or did someone just want to shake things up a little bit? Um, I'm also documenting the exact colors that are used in every scheme, and that's what the spectrometer is for. And I'm reconstructing many of the schemes um, of older maps that used patterns to create a wide variety of classes with relatively few inks and pattern combinations. For example, this scheme uses only three inks, brown, blue, and red. But through the creative use of patterns and overprinting, and um, not printing color in the lowest class, at the very top, uh, we get an eight class scheme. And I am also in the process of creating digital analogs for all of my sampled schemes. So for instance, in this example here, I recreated the scheme on the right in Illustrator. And then uh, I also in Photoshop produced a spot color mimic uh, of the screen effects on the left. And of course, if you zoom out, you can see at this small scale, at this distance, of, um, the screen patterns are imperceptible, and our eyes cannot tell the difference between the colors on the right and the colors on the left. Um, and this is common with most of these uh, older maps. They use minimal amount of ink and patterns to produce a large number of data classes. And screen recreation takes up quite a bit of time, which is why I am being selective. Now, this is another example I just wanted to show. It's a 16-class hypsometric scheme uh, from 1944. And a little closer look reveals that there are six inks, five patterns, and combined, they produce 16 classes. On the right is my recreation, approximate recreation of that scheme. And again, at a distance, if you zoom out, your eyes should see 16 colors, not six inks and five patterns. Um, I should also note uh, that it is very difficult to refrain from tumbling down and getting stuck in a rabbit hole. And my current favorite thing that I am looking at right now, uh, my main focus for the past couple of months have been just the history and the standardization of hypsometric and bathymetric schemes. And one thing I've noticed is that pseudo-realistic illustrative um, terrain legends have fallen out of favor. And which is a, a crying shame. They're beautiful. But why is that? Why aren't these used frequently? Uh, it's another question for me to pursue, or if anybody else wants to and get back to me, I would really appreciate it. Uh, another important issue in, that I'm exploring, and it rankles me, is why class sizes are so frequently abused. The classed versus unclassed debate has been uh, ongoing for nearly 50 years. And I can't read a journal today without coming across at least one map or visualization uh, that uses a dicey scheme, a dicey classification method, or uh, worse, both of those with an absurd number of classes and colors. For instance, this map up here, it's from 1987. It displays North American gravity anomalies, and it uses a staggering 66 classes and colors. And the sequence of colors is illogical. They should have just used an unclassed data set, but instead it's been classed, and it is <laughs> impossible for the map reader to reliably match a specific data value or color in the legend to the value and the color on the map. So this is my approximate starting point for pursuing these questions. And since this is uh, approximately 1875, is the era, uh, time when map makers started adopting modern printing, uh, color printing and mapping technology. And I could go on and on. I'd love to go on and on, but I have nothing conclusive uh, yet to tell you. I'm still pursuing, I'm st actually I'm still kind of just pulling all of the puzzle pieces out of the box. But taken all together, there have been um, a lot of influencing factors and there are a lot of gaps yet to fill that I need to find out about in order to, well, learn how, what has shaped our color mapping habits. And as I continue to make headway in answering these why questions, I promise I will report back to you. Thank you.